Is it happening? Is it real? Uh, it's happening. Ah, oh, it's happening. It's, it's real. Hi. <laughs> Dr. James Grime. Yes, hi. It, it is you indeed. Uh, so I apologize. I've been so excited to talk to you. Uh, just getting the email back, I was absolutely <laughs> full. So I very much appreciate this. Uh, I can only disappoint you. I, no, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. So I, uh, I've i been like for four or five days just trying to think of like, what are some great questions that I could possibly ask you? What are some things that I could go with to intrigue you? And so uh, it, it struck me when I was talking to um, uh, Professor Ian Stewart, mm -hmm. I asked him about some interesting stories and he, he said Ada Lovelace, um, he was talking about Ada Lovelace and how she was like uh, considered one of the first computer programmers. And one thing kind of hint that he hint that she hinted at was that these computer programs could write poetry or music. Mm -hmm. And so in the early 1800s, Ada Lovelace had the wherewithal to know that AI could come around. That's absolutely right. Yeah. So they were considering these computing machines like electronic brains. I mean, that is the... That's the like the, the almost science fiction way of thinking about these things instead of just being calculating machines, right? right. Uh, which have which have one purpose, uh, which is what machines were before then. So machines would have one purpose. You know, a clock is a clock, and it doesn't do anything else. Correct. Uh, and so a, a computer is different in that it can do more than one thing, yeah. uh, which is what your mobile phone will do because it will have an app, so it can be a clock, or it can be a calendar, or it can be a browser, or it can do many things. So or it's multi-purpose. As, as my seven-year-old likes to use it as a flashlight dad. Oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so so multi-purpose. Right, so right. Well, it can, so... it can pop open a door, <laughs> you know, you can, it can fix a wobbly table. <laughs> multi-purpose. Yeah, yeah, because when you're at the restaurant, you know, there's nothing <laughs> worse than trying to eat. So I so with this idea of AI in mind, and I, I kept looking for more information just about you as a human being. And I cannot like you are incredibly impressive for as public of a life that you have. You're fairly private. You don't have a Wikipedia page. <laughs> right. And, and you, I, there's I, I, I had a hard time finding stuff about, you know, grow, your your youth and things. So. Mm -hmm. I used Chat GPT, and I asked Chat GPT to write a biography of you. Okay, am I am I going to grade this? Yeah, yes, as well you should. So, I, I in in Chat GPT, I said write a biography of James Grime, mathematician, under one hundred and fifty words. Are you ready? Yes, I am ready. And and, and <laughs> I'm excited. Very curious. To what it says. James Grime is a renowned mathematician celebrated for his groundbreaking research and engaging public outreach. With a PhD in mathematics from the University of Cambridge, he has made significant contributions to number theory and cryptography. Grimes's passion for mathematics extends beyond academia as he captivates audiences with his charismatic presentations and informative YouTube videos. His ability to explain complex concepts in a re relatable manner has garnered him a devoted following, inspiring a renowned interest in mathematics worldwide. Grimes' unwavering dedication to promoting mathematical literacy and his innovative contributions to the field have solidified his position as a leading figure in the mathematics community. Oh, well, that's, I mean, I want to meet that person. Uh, <laughs> that's very grand. <laughs> and um, I'm not uh, completely accurate either, uh, which uh, which if you, if anyone who's played with chat, chat GBT have yes. discovered, it's very good at um, fluff. Uh, fluff, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but not necessarily accurate. Uh, so you did graduate from Cambridge with a PhD. Um, no, see, there you go. I no, I did work at Cambridge. Uh, I graduated from Lancaster University, first of all, with, okay. with my bachelor's, as we call it, and then um, York University with a PhD. Oh. And then I did work at the University of Cambridge. 
Okay, so you so you were just working. So it's just, just picking random words. Yeah, here at the exactly. That's all it did. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love that it's 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 wholly uh, inaccurate then, and but there is some things that are accurate. And here's and here's where um here's where I do agree with ChatGPT. Okay, all right, and 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 you're gonna have to just be okay with it. Uh, <laughs> you have inspired a lot of people to do more thinking and you've inspired a lot of people to accept mathematical literacy uh or to to kind of um to engage in mathematical literacy i'll i'll say that because uh I, and i can't get an accurate figure on this but you your your videos uh with number file and everything else that you've done uh i million uh, tens of millions at and that's very conservative at least tens of millions probably even in a hundred of millions uh, of, of views so uh for that i mean you are absolutely considered a, a leader in mathematical thinking well who who would have expected it as well um <laughs> when you have a maths youtube video or youtube channel who would expect that that would get like you said hundreds of millions of views right uh, but you know we, we put it out there and it turns out there was that audience who want to watch those kind of videos. Right. Um, you know, when people aren't lo looking over your shoulder, going, well, what are you watching? You're watching a maths video. Ugh. <laughs> when people can just watch it at home. And yeah, loads of people want to watch it. Loads of people are interested. Yeah. I'll tell you uh, what really got me hooked is um, during my lunch breaks. So, uh, I, I eat lunch by myself and I, the, the, the videos are perfect because they're like 15 minutes and, and we get 20, we get 20 minutes to eat. So, uh, the, I, I put those videos on and I'm, you know, I'm eating and watching out of one eye and, uh, you have given me, uh, you've given me so many lessons and so many like starter conversation or conversation starters. Um, I, I my favorite, uh, you know, is zero even, uh, right. It's such an entry, it, like everything that you guys have done with that. And I don't know who to credit you or Brady, but probably, yeah. probably Brady with the ideas of, of editing and putting it all together. Yeah. But you, the, the way you present ideas uh, is the entry level is so perfect for my kids. And so it gives me a lot of really good ideas on, hey, we could start here. Let me just, if, if, if my kids are struggling with any, anything, let's just have a conversation about math and just is zero even and let yeah. this take off and then you, using your videos as kind of a guide on where i can take it is is great and it's and that is an interesting question isn't it it's it's, it's one i like uh to sort of throw out sometimes because how can how can nothing be something so how can nothing have a property like being even or being odd right uh, so people will say well then it's it's neither but no no it really is and it passes every Past every definition of evenness, it is it is very even, uh, but it's surprising. So you get to have that conversation, and then similarly, you have you know is is one a prime number, uh, right. which is a very similar. It's all about you know what categories do we put these numbers in, right? And and, uh, and in that case, one one does sit in its own category, right? Yeah, well, it's, it's not a prime. Although it once was considered to be a prime. Wait, so does, you can understand does, why people... <laughs> does it pass the test? Does it fit yeah, the Yeah, why people want to say, well, is it or isn't it? Well, I think it is. Right. Because it, at one point it was considered a prime and it now has been excluded from being a prime uh, for technical mathematical reasons. Right. And that and that and that uh, that leads to my ability to have kids start thinking about definitions in mathematics mm. being extremely important, right? Definitions mm. are the, they they're the uh, they're the, the 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 lines that we play within as far as mathematics is concerned, right? Like if you imagine a a, a football pitch having those lines, I see how I did that. Um, <laughs> in America, nobody would know what those words are. But you know, if you you know within those lines, the definitions are what keep us uh, kind of all together and inside the same playing field. Yes. 
Um, and so having those questions, you know, is one a prime or is zero even, uh, it allows students to do their own thinking and test those boundaries of definitions. And that's that's what I really took away from all that is, is, is getting kids to think about definitions, which leads me to my next question. Okay. Uh, kind of a two-parter because in, in, in America and, and in England, uh, England's a lot more proper. Um, and I've read this, that uh, we call this a trapezoid, right? Mm -hmm. Call this a trapezoid, uh, where in England, it's a trapezium. Is that correct? Trapezium. Trapezium. Oh, I knew I'd get that wrong. Uh, <laughs> trapezium. All right. So, uh, and that's because there was a mistake in like 1780. There was a mistake mm. made in a paper and it wasn't caught until the late 1800s. And in England, they said, well, it's proper. So we're going to go with trapezium, whereas trapezoid is was the, the lazy American way of going. Um, so the question I have, though, about the definition, is the definition of a trapezium, is it at least one set of parallel sides or exactly one set of parallel sides? Now, I have to admit, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about the definitions of quadrilaterals you shouldn't uh, no. <laughs> you have more important things to do <laughs> and it is it's 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 oh is it exactly so you're saying is a square a trapezium for example correct a rectangle correct are I the see are, what you're asking is the parallelogram family a part of the trapezoids sorry trapeziums mm. or is a trapezium yeah. its own unique kind of like a kite, its own unique type of quadrilateral? Well, uh, without looking anything up in any sort of books or anything off the top of my head, uh, typically on these things, like um, it would be, it would be um, a square would be a special type of trapezium, I would say. Okay. So you, you at least or a rectangle would be a special type of trapezium. Yeah. So, in the same way, a square is a special type of rectangle. OK. And that and that that's that that's my preferred method is that uh, mm. that parallelograms are a, a subset of the trapezium family. Um, however, the, the, uh, I, I spent way too much time because I do teach geometry, uh, Euclidean geometry, and uh, we spend time on these definitions and um, if you go to Wikipedia, they, it, it, there's a whole set dedicated to inclusivity and exclusivity on that exact topic. So I just, does anything break down if you use um, a square in a, some sort of calculating the area of a trapezium or anything like that? Does anything break down? Um, no, actually, it actually then, it works out really lovely if you use it, the, the, the formula for a trapezium. If you if you use it, it it will uh, beautifully work out that uh, all all of the formulas for area uh, are, fit nicely within it as well. Uh, however, you do need parallelograms in order to uh, to like um, uh, derive the formula for the area of a of a trapezium. So it's kind of an interesting one. Uh, so. <laughs> One thing that you uh, I, I read on your website, you were really uh, you, you got you were looking for different manipulatives in mathematics, uh, ways of like um, explaining ideas, and you couldn't find them online. So you just built them yourself. One being the grime dice. Right. Which you're. Yes. Uh, which you said on, on your website, you were very, you know, uh, pleasantly surprised that people would call them that because you were challenged to make these die yeah and you and you enjoyed making them uh i i love that you you what you've done you've done it with an eye on helping educators with lesson plans and and putting something together so that people can uh use these ideas in the classroom which i really appreciate well correct because so i could use them oh. in in <laughs> shows and classrooms and things like that when i want to show someone uh, some interesting or funny mathematical thing i make a prop for myself uh and then you know if i can make a thousand of them maybe <laughs> that's just as good <laughs> that makes sense that makes sense so uh 
I have uh, I put my team to the te my team. Uh, we have a tech guy at our school here who uh, has a 3D printer. And I found some things online that I thought were uh, not just online, but just some things that I've encountered in mathematics that I really enjoyed. And I wanted to share those with you and see if you could tell me or see if you could figure out mm. exactly. Do you know what this is? Well, this looks like a saddle point. Yeah. This looks like something with curvature zero or something. Yeah. Is that what it is? It's a hyperbolic paraboloid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, saddle point. That's exactly right. Yeah. It's uh I, so it's curving this way in the same way it's curving that way. Kind of like a Pringle. Uh, which yeah. gives you an average curvature of zero or some, something along those lines. It's something along those lines. Yeah. Um, and then I was, I, I, uh -huh. I had them print one of these, which I think is absolutely fantastic. And it has a magnet. So it sticks to my, sticks to my, uh, my, my whiteboard. I love yes, Klein like, bottle. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> some of those, some of those things, you know, that I guess some of Klein was dealing in topology, right? Is that what mm. it was? And, yeah. and, and there had a volume of zero, but just that, that idea of a Klein bottle and uh, just absolutely fascinated me uh, so much. It, it, I, I've just absolutely been obsessed with these ideas ever since. And I can't, I can't get them out of my head. Um, I saw that you you you're dealing with uh, oh, is it, back to the idea of grind. It, I'm sorry. I just had all my notes here, and it just it blows my mind. So, um, <laughs> uh, have you tried these uh, dice? I have not. No, but I've I've made my own. So, um, ah. yeah. So, uh, like when we we're doing, uh, you can't really hardly tell, but it's mm. colors. So we wanted um, three blue, two green, and one red. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I I just I just took a regular dice and put uh, colored sticky tabs on there, and I had a couple okay. of those, and it worked really well, especially whenever I looked at your, um, I saw your video on. Um, population not necessarily population but like uh will your name move on and you yes. a random dice uh a random <laughs> die roll and you're like oh well that guy he didn't pass his name on and he, it was actually a pretty funny video uh and it, that kind of got me thinking about using uh making my own uh uh just to deal with probability as far as that goes um but uh, yeah I, I, that's another story that i enjoy this these these the story of these victorian gentlemen all worried about their noble names dying out going, what, so what's the what's the chance my noble name is going to die because if i don't have any sons right then my my name will die out right. and yeah a mathematician actually went you know sort of worked out okay well this is how this is how when you pass your surname to your son as it was in those days uh you know this is the maths of it and this is the chance your name will die out wow <laughs> So uh, and it's, it's not a very noble uh, motivation for, for some math, but it is interesting math because it's also the same math of, say, you know, you're passing your genes on to you know, your children or or a disease that replicates in a certain way. It has the same maths behind that. Right. And you do a lot in terms of combinatorics where you you deal with uh, you deal with finding. I don't want to say probably I, I don't know if probability is the right word, but uh, you're doing a lot of uh like your research that you did earlier had to deal with like finding uh you know finding like i don't want to say I, I don't know the exact way of putting it but like calculating what that would take uh to pass on your surname or you know it that might be similar seemingly trivial however the applications turn out to be uh much more interesting now speaking of victorian you went to you like worked at cambridge like, which see is seemingly is a, is a historical place. Yeah. Did you ever like walking the halls of buildings like that? <laughs> did you ever just think like, I'm walking the same halls as so and so, or you know that's that's the building where such and such was thought yes. of, or like what? No, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I worked in the maths department. By the time I worked at Cambridge. The maths department had its own 
maths village. So it wasn't the historical maths department, mm. which would have been in the centre of Cambridge and would have been hundreds of years old. And right. also, by, and it wasn't fit for purpose. That's why they moved into this beautiful high-tech new building. So that's where I worked. Uh, although I could walk past, you know, the room where Andrew Wiles announced his proof of Fermat's last theorem. Right. So I did have that. So I go, that's where Fermat's last theorem was announced. <laughs> uh, we had, we do have um, a tree there, which I'm told is grown from Newton's apple tree. Wow. Yeah. But, you know, who knows? You know, that, that could that could just be a lie. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but they say it is. And you go, oh, OK, then. Yeah, the, the, um, the admissions office has come up with some pretty, pretty good ones. <laughs> it sounds good. Yeah. Uh, and, and then, yeah, yeah, you have the historical Cambridge as well. And you walk through that and you just think, well, aren't these, aren't these students so lucky to, to go here? Right. right. Uh, any of your other uh, uh, stops along the way, Lancaster or York, do you ever did you ever find yourself just thinking about, you know, the the just walking through history while you're there? Or since you grew up in these areas where history is just thousands of years old and <laughs> here in Kansas, I mean, I mean, I'm in central United States, right? In Kansas, like our history runs about 150 years, right? Like somebody's yeah. great grandpa started this whole thing, right? So it's not that historical, so to speak, but you know, you're, you're walking on, you know. Yeah. North York in particular um, is like that. So York was set up by Vikings. Okay. It was known as Jorvik. Um, so so we're talking Viking times, so a thousand uh, or something years ago. Um, a lot of Viking uh, names around there. And then, and then, yeah, the cathedral, not a cathedral, the minster that we have in York is, I don't know how old it is, but about you know, a thousand years old and it, where Emperor Constantine was <laughs> made emperor or some or something like that you know so we're talking about roman emperors you know we're we're here in wow. and uh yeah just just uh just history all over the place we're, we're not so bothered by it we're tripping over the history yeah we've got so much of it yeah you people really... live in how you know in the uk it's not unusual to live in a house that is you know 500 years old <laughs> right. and it's just it's just a house right where people live where, yeah. where for you it might be a, an amazing historical significant place. Exactly. Well, it's it's just a house where I live in. So I take my kids to go see uh, every year. I take my kids to. Uh, we have a library here in town uh, in Kansas City that has um, some really incredible books. Uh, they have a book printed in 1482. It was the first uh, time that they used metallic diagrams and printings of Euclid's elements uh, mm. incredibly beautifully done uh, it was printed in 1482 uh, and then we had there's like a first edition of Newton's Principia there's mm. um, a, a first edition of Kepler's books uh, there's some really interesting historical books that they have that you can I mean they let they let me and my students flip through the pages which is insane and you know, on the bus ride home, a, a student goes, you know, that that elements, that book elements, um, the American Revolution was closer to now than it was the printing of that book. And I I like I had to take a second because, mm -hmm. I mean, our our place in history is just so new. Like, I feel like we're still taking yeah. the cellophane off, you know? Yeah, but we, we still don't compare to uh, somewhere like Egypt. Right. <laughs> Right. Or or um, Iraq. Right. With 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 right. all of the history they have there in Mesopotamia. All right. So I, I have some some this or that type questions in the lightning round that I wanted to go over with you. OK, so uh, I have to say what which I prefer or something like yeah, that. Whatever you prefer, whichever, you, you know, whatever strikes you. Um, and and I want to see uh, this. This is just all over the map. So I don't know how you're going to handle this. So we'll see how this works. Okay. Uh, so first gut reaction, whatever you feel. 
who had a bigger impact, Archimedes or Euclid? Uh, Euclid. Would you rather take a trip to the moon or Mars? Mm, uh, the moon. Okay. Uh, what What's a better flavor, chocolate or vanilla? Oh, uh, vanilla. What's a better football club, Cambridge United or Cambridge FC? I haven't got a clue what either of those things are or mean. So there you go. Would you rather be lucky or uh, would you rather have luck or skill? Uh, skill. Do you do you like Star Wars or Star Trek? Uh, Star Trek. What is more? What 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 do you prefer? Bangers and mash or fish and chips? Ooh, fish and chips. Marvel Comics or DC? DC. Ramanujan or Euler? Ooh, Euler. Was math invented or discovered? Good question. That's that's that one. Doesn't, that's a that's a big question. You've just I slipped in there. Um, I what I want to be true is that it is discovered. Yeah, you can debate this because it's a great question for debating. But I want it to be discovered. It's slightly more romantic that way. Ah, oh, you say it so much better than I can. Yeah, you say it so much better than I. <laughs> I, I I've had years of thinking about this idea, mm -hmm. and you're right. It it is a very big question. Um, you and and, and you say it way more elegantly than I ever. The world I want to live in. Correct. Is that it's like, it's like it is out there to be discovered. Correct. And and the arguments that I have for it are very, as you say, romantic. It It's something that tugs at my heart. I want it to be that it's there to be discovered. Uh, and all of the professors that I asked so far, um, some just it's invented. Leave it alone, <laughs> <laughs> which is interesting. Uh, and, and the thing that really got me. So I talked to Dr. Bruce Burnt. Uh, he studied Ramanujan and he did huh. all uh, all like 3,800 equations where Ramanujan put the equation and the solution out. He printed, printed those, but he never gave the proof for it. Well, yeah. he had proofs for them on Slate or something else. <laughs> but there were several of these equations and solutions that required um, like math that wasn't discovered or invented um until like 1970s or 80s and so uh dr burnt had an issue trying to figure out what in the world ramanujan was doing to be able to go from this equation to this solution with the math that he knew at the time and that to me hinted at the idea that it needs that math is being discovered not invented but he was very adamant that math is invented not discovered <laughs> even though he has evidence kind of at his fingertips that it's that it's discovered uh, well it, it, i don't know it depends on if an alien from another planet would come up with the same maths right i would or, imagine that the symbols of or the even a different universe would have the same math with the, the I, I with the way they talk about it might be different but maybe mm. their their uh, problems and solutions would be the same. I don't know. No, and I'm not a philosophical mathematician, but right. it, it feels like there are some things that exist anyway. The idea of oneness and twoness and threeness. Correct. Yeah. And other things are consequences of these basic principles, which in maths we call axioms. Um. But yeah, so I'd like to think there are some things that are just so fundamental. They are there and would be discovered. Right. Uh, in whatever universe. Correct. Yeah, that's. Man, you're such a really. And then there'll be people arguing the opposite view. So. Who knows? <laughs> Which makes it interesting because you're dealing with mathematicians. Last question. Who invented calculus? Newton or Leibniz? Ah. Uh... Well, I mean, the the real answer is they both invented it independently, right? 
or who's um, credited for calculus i guess if we want to say it that way invented or well i think these days and just in case anyone who's watching this and doesn't know this story which is newton um invented discovered <laughs> right uh calculus for his calculations about planetary motion, wrote wrote it down, but didn't say anything about it because he just used it in what he was doing. Right, Leibniz created his uh, invention of calculus and said, "Look what I've done." And then Newton went, oh, "I did it a few years ago, and here's the proof that I did it a few years. I just didn't tell anyone. Therefore, I should get the yeah." Because Newton, Newton famously didn't like to publish. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I, I'm. I mean, they, I'm happy to say they both did it independently. And I, but I think now the story is so well known. I think now, I mean, they're jointly credited. If you talk about the history of calculus, they will be jointly credited. I think now at this point, I, 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 I'm not going to rehash a 300-year-old flame war at this point. Sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I think we're over it. We're over it. Okay, we're we've we've moved past collectively. <laughs> uh, what would be more important to you, uh, or or what would be a, a a better feather in your hat? Um, winning an a, an an able prize for your work in mathematics, mm. or um, uh, being accepted to the Royal Society, being a, oh. a fellow Royal fellow oh, Royal uh, Society. If I say one without the other, it might, it might sound like a, a slight. <laughs> Um, I, I mean, I mean and, I'm, and honestly, there's probably little chance I'm going to win any able prize or anything like that, uh, because because you know that is for the greatest mathematicians and a lifetime of work. Uh, so are we just playing a fantasy? Oh, um, I don't, I I can't, I can't answer that. You beat, you beat me. One, I can't answer. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. What do you think? Yeah. It's like. What what does it mean know. in 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 your world and what you do? What would it? What does what does being a fellow of the Royal Society mean? I mean, I don't know. I don't really know what it gets for you, anyway. So I, I, I don't know what the advantage of something like that. Well, uh, have you spoken is. with Ian Stewart? Um, he he knows he knows you, Professor oh. Ian Stewart, right? You know who I'm talking about? Yeah, I do. He so he yeah he's very familiar with you and Matt Parker and and I oh. call it the, the gang, but y'all y'all what y'all have done is is absolutely amazing and and I credit Ian Stewart as kind of like taking taking it from its infancy and into the modern age of mm -hmm. um, mathematics me media so to speak I don't know how mm -hmm. else to call it but it's a, it's a, its own niche and what you and Matt Parker uh, and Brady have done. Uh, it just really exploded it, and um, so I, I I I had the chance to ask him about what it means to be in the Royal Society, uh, and and I I just didn't get that answer from him because I guess he kind of skirted it. Is there so, is, is 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 there something secretive about it that I I don't know. I've not I've not I've not been asked. I don't know. I don't know what it means. Uh, so I can't answer that question either. I'm afraid. Okay. All right, fair enough. I I'm, it's because I don't know. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. Oh. You're uh, you're a, a treasure, and I really appreciate you uh, giving me uh, so much of your time. And I'm sorry for being so nervous. Uh, oh. you're, it's it's strange. I've I, I used to work in radio. I've met all sorts of like movie stars, rock stars, and all sorts of stuff. And I was never been as nervous as I am for talking to you. So it's the, le the least impressive person you've talked to. I, I'm, you, I promise you. It's 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 so weird. My I telling my wife who who I was, who I get to talk to this morning, and she just goes, "I have no idea. I don't." But when I met you know uh, what Dwayne the Rock Johnson, for example, yeah. my wife was like, "Can I come to work with you today? Like you know, I'll, I'll get dressed up and all this. like." And that was that was who cares about that but like you for example you know so to each his own i guess right <laughs> well um, um, it's nice to hear it's nice to hear but hopefully you'll see that i'm just a very normal person as a lot of mathematicians are oh yes that and that and that's We're just regular nerdy people
Right. There you go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, thank you again so much for your time. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very much. Yeah. We'll talk to you later.